Hello, and welcome to the No BS Debates with City Council candidates for Denver at large. We are your moderators. I am De La Vaca. And I'm Sarah Alley. And we want to thank all the candidates that are running for coming out to represent the community. Uh, we also want to thank Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters for hosting this event. And lastly, we want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in. Uh, your participation in the democratic process is what makes it work. So the debate rules go as follows. Uh, us, your moderators, will ask the individual candidates questions on a topic of civil rights or other related topics. Uh, the candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer, after which the other candidate will have an opportunity to rebut for one minute. The first candidate will have an opportunity to reply. We encourage a lively debate here, but we will interrupt if someone goes too long. This debate is slated for 50 minutes as we draw into the last Five minutes, we will end the debate and push into the lightning round. At that time, <clears throat> candidates will be asked close-ended questions, which you must answer in concise fashion about your position, meaning either yes or no. Got it? Okay. Tonight's debate is with our at-large candidates. The winner, winners, there'll be two, I believe, of this election will be responsible for the entire city and not just a specific neighborhood mm -hmm. or district. Uh, joining us today, from right to left, we have Robin Kanich, Debbie Ortega, Anthony Tony Pigford, Jesse LaShawn, Johnny Hayes, and Lynn Langdon. Hi. Let's begin with our candidates' opening statements, beginning with Councilwoman Kanich. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Robin Kanich, and it's been my honor to be a partner and champion to this community as your at-large councilwoman. I live up in Northeast Park Hill with my wife and my son. I have grown up in a working class family and really dedicated my career to working to empower communities to have a voice and change. I'm very proud of the record of things that we have partnered on to achieve in the area of civil rights while during my time on council. This includes um, creating gender neutral restrooms for LGBTQ folks to have more bathroom options. It includes banning conversion therapy, making it illegal to discriminate against someone in housing based on their source of income People were being turned away from apartments they could afford just because of how they paid, especially impacting those who are disabled um, and Native American and African American families. I partnered with leaders of color to get them a seat at a table to influence the use of force policies by our police department, resulting in one of the most assertive and uh, high standards for use of force in the country. Um, and I also worked with leaders to help to reform and update our independent monitor's office, some of whom are here in the audience today. Thank you for that partnership with the community. I look forward to continuing to serve this city if you elect me as your, one of your two at-large council members working to make sure we're inclusive, building on successes for affordable housing, transportation, and inclusivity. Thank you. Ms. Ortega. Good evening. Um, I'm Deborah Ortega, and um, I am currently serving as one of the two at-large members of City Council. And I started um, my involvement in politics um, working for our Lieutenant Governor. I worked for a U.S. Senator, and then I worked for a city councilman who decided not to run, and I ran for his seat. Um, I've had the opportunity and the privilege of working with neighborhoods across this city, both as a district council member and now as an at-large member. I've worked on many, many different issues related to um, environmental justice, worked very closely with all the neighborhoods along the I-70 corridor around um, what's happening today and what has occurred in the past. I was one of the original co-sponsors of our Equal Protection Ordinance that went all the way to the Supreme Court and was withheld. Um, I have worked on many different issues that have addressed some of the, the very issues that Councilwoman Kanich just talked about as well. And, you know, I came to this job as a single parent. Um, so I raised my daughter in our Denver public school system. I'm a product of our, our schools, as is my, my grandchildren. And um, I think fighting for the rights for our kids, making sure we've got safe schools is, is all a part of that and ensuring that we always have um, communities of color engaged in the conversation so that we're not an afterthought in the process. Thank you. Mr. Pickford. Good evening, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, thank you for the hosts and moderators. 
Uh, my name is Tony Pickford. Uh, I'm a first-time candidate, unless you count three successful runs in student council in high school, um, which I do. <laughs> I'm a fourth-generation Denverite, a third-generation product of Denver Public Schools. Uh, me and my family have been in Denver working to shape Denver and make it a more vibrant place for over 100 years. I spent the first half of my professional career um, in the for-profit sector doing all sorts of interesting and fun things. Uh, for the last decade, I've dedicated my life to uh, Denver's kids and have worked in youth leadership development and education. I've been a student voice and leadership coordinator with Denver Public Schools where that work reached 22 different Denver Public Schools, uh, high schools. And uh, most recently, I'm the founding dean of the only all-boys public middle school in the region, the Boys School of Denver. Uh, the reason I'm running for Denver City Council is because I think we need more proactive and bold leadership on City Council. I love our city. It's a very unique city, but unfortunately, it's going the way of other cities with traffic congestion, pollution, a broken housing market, and no real plan for our children or our aging communities. So we need leaders with a sense of urgency who will treat crisis level issues as the emergencies that they are, but also leaders with a great sense of possibility because we can make Denver the most vibrant, equitable, and sustainable city in the country. Again, my name is Tony Pigford. I hope to earn your vote May 7th and be one of your city council at large representatives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jesse LaShawn Paris. I'm running for city council at large because for the exact reasons Tony just stated, we need proactive and bold leadership on this current council. I am a native of 30 years. I was born and raised in Northeast Denver. I've done work um, involving our homeless community for the past five years. I founded a nonprofit known as Denver Homeless Out Loud. We're the ones that's responsible for the Rights to Rest Act that's been run at the State House for the past four years. And now we're running a ballot initiative at the city level known as the Right to Survive. We ask that you vote yes on 300. I've dealt with issues, um, homelessness issues, issues around poverty, issues around um, race. I also help with the Office of Independent Monitor. I've helped with ban the box legislation, abolish slavery from the Colorado Constitution legislation, and a slew of other things. The reason why I'm running is because I'm fed up with the way this current administration treats its less fortunate residents and citizens. And I feel that I can be a voice um, for those that do not have a voice and that have been forgotten, maligned, neglected, displaced, gentrified out of their neighborhoods. So I ask for your vote on May 7th. Thank you. Mr. Hayes. My name is Johnny Hayes and I'm running for city council at large. Um, I am an advocate for the deaf community. I am an advocate for children's rights. Um, I am an artist and an historian, uh, which is why my face looks like this, because um, I love my history. And uh, I believe in fighting for people who are not me. I believe in fighting for everyone who needs a voice, who needs someone to speak up for them. I've been a volunteer for the city of Denver th since 2002, primarily working with children in the homeless population. Uh, I've seen too much, which, too many problems that are solvable that are just not being addressed. The way that our children are treated in the system uh, needs to be fixed. I'm an advocate for all children of, of every class, every color, to have the best education possible, the best treatment possible to uh, represent every community that needs representation. That's why I'm running at large to represent the entire city of Denver and to be diverse. I am an historian, a musician, a, a filmmaker, and an artist. And I believe in bringing those job opportunities to Denver, encouraging the arts here, uh, promoting the music industry, promoting the film industry. And you get to vote for two of us, so thanks for having us here. Thank you. And uh, finally, Ms. Langdon. Hi everyone, I'm Lynn Langdon. I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm honored to be with these individuals who are all running. Um, I am a true Colorado girl. I was raised here in Boulder, Colorado. Most of my family lives here. I um, went off, well actually when I grew up I was um, recognized over and over again for my leadership abilities and my speaking abilities and my optimism. I went off and traveled the world. I've lived in some of the biggest cities around the world and 
uh, to that, I have gained a tremendous perspective of what works and what doesn't in cities. Um, I've come back home. I love Colorado. I, we are so lucky to live here in this wonderful place. Uh, there's no, no place like it. And I want to do an amazing job for Denver. I uh, decided to run organically because um, I felt that I could bring Denver into a brighter future. I have big picture ideas, and I would like to see us go into our future strongly. More than that, I knocked on doors, and I met people directly for two weeks before I decided to run because I wanted to get to know people and see uh, what their concerns were and for me to be accessible to the people so that they could meet me directly. And I heard your concerns and I know that you are concerned about the overdevelopment and the unplanned um, uninvolvement of the community. And I'm here to help that communication process be better. Thank you so much, Lynn Langdon. Thank you. So we'll start with the first question here. Um, a little bit of information to premise first. Denver will be voting on Initiative 300, an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in a non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. The Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless from city-mandated property seizures and camping bans that leaves officers confiscating properties in all kinds of weather conditions. This is a, this is a city authorized police action which leaves the unhoused facing any adverse health outcomes, including up to death, and which also deprives them of personal property. Do you support 300? If not, or if so, um, which other areas of our city resources should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? Uh, we'll begin with you, uh, Councilwoman. Um, Kanich. Kanich. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I served on the council when this ordinance for the camping ban was introduced and I fought it hard. I voted against it. I ran five amendments from the floor with my colleague, Councilwoman uh, Ortega, and it passed anyway. I'm not participating in either of the campaigns that are happening for the 300 initiative because neither is focused on the um, evidence proven results to give people dignity in housing. So the work that I'm doing is focused on three areas. First, supportive housing. We have housed more than 7,000 folks who've been experiencing homelessness, and I helped to create the first ever housing fund, including a fee on development, and more than 25% of that fund is geared towards or targeting folks who are experiencing homelessness to get them into housing. I'm working on prevention. I created the first ever eviction defense fund as well as portion of the housing fund is going for emergency rental assistance to stop the flow of people into homelessness. Third, more dignified um, villages where people can live with bathrooms, trash service, lighting and safety in interim conditions, tiny homes or an encampment, but with dignity. And I have a bill that I have been drafting if I am reelected that would be introduced in July and would help to create a faster approval system for regulated tiny home villages. Lastly, focusing on reorienting our shelter system. Right now we are not helping people get into housing. We're saving lives which is critical, but we need to make the shelters work better to get folks into housing. So I'm into proven solutions, and I'm into making sure that we give folks the dignity they deserve. Thank you. Councilwoman Ortega, please. So for, <coughs> excuse me, seven and a half years, I was the executive director of the Denver's Road Home Program for the Homeless Commission that created the 10-year plan that was focused on trying to address the needs of our unhoused people in the city of Denver. And, you know, our focus was making sure that we shored up having enough shelter beds. At the time that the ordinance was brought forward to create the camping ban, it did not bring any resources to the table. So I also voted no on that. Um, and I thought that was critically important that if we were going to create um, a, a law that was going to not allow people to sleep outside, we needed to have the right tools to give them a place to go and to make sure that their needs were being met. I've also been the president of a nonprofit called Del Norte that has been around for over 38 years and we have done nothing but build affordable housing for all various special needs populations in our city. And we need housing, support services, and jobs, livable wage jobs. Thank you. As a reminder, uh, after the initial candidate replies, we'll have five minutes of open debate. That's uh, 
one minute per person. If other folks want to jump in to respond, rebut, or add their own opinion, you have that opportunity. No, I appreciate the question. Um, ultimately, what we're talking about is one of the two most <coughs> pressing issues that any city can face, um, which is mass inequity. Um, the other would be climate change. Um, mass inequity is, is arguably uh, the greatest threat to local security and national security. And so um, based off of my personal values around 300, uh, I'm going to vote uh, yes on 300. And that's based on my personal values. That's about dignity, humanity. Um, I'm not at all, it, it's, it's really upset me that we're taking blankets from people on the street in freezing weather. Um, people are, are losing their lives and, and losing limbs due to frostbite. The camping ban has been inhumane. It's important that city council members voted against it, but that's just scratching the surface as far as what can be done since. That camping ordinance was passed in 2012, um, and there was a lot of work that could have been done uh, to fix things so that we weren't at the crisis level situation that we are now. Just as, as some context, uh, Councilman Brooks helped author and promote this. His district, District 9, has some of the highest rates of unhoused persons still. Uh, the idea of the camping ban is essentially to push people out of Center City, out of eyesight. Uh, refusing to support it strikes me as supporting that while putting off solutions that take longer to implement than we have. Uh, how do we answer the problem today while still working for solutions that answer in the long term? Oh, I wanted to answer the first question. Keep going. Okay, so I'm the only one up here that's been unhoused under this current urban camping ban. So I know firsthand the effects that it's having on our unhoused neighbors because I've experienced it firsthand. Like I said in my intro, my organization, Deborah Homeless Out Loud, has been fighting this urban camping ban since it's been passed for the past, what, seven, almost eight years now along with Occupy Denver, because it, it was a response to Occupy Denver. And Occupy Denver was actually feet in our unhoused neighbors during this time, and the mayor s said that that was an issue and decided to pass this ordinance along with members of council, such as Albus Brooks. We need immediate, so immediate solutions. We never said 300 was a solution. We said that 300 would give those that are unhoused the rights that everybody else has, the rights to survival, the right to dignity, and the right to privacy. That's all this is. There, there's a lot of fear mongering going on. There's a lot of um, misinformation going around. All this is going to do is make sure our unhoused neighbors are not being criminalized for surviving on the streets. We have time for one more response. I'd love to respond if I may. Please. Um, first of all, I am, uh, I will say that I am for 300 and whether or not this initiative passes, if I get elected to city council, I'll work to solving the homeless crisis. Um, homelessness is not mentioned once in the language of this initiative and I wanted to point that out because we all understand the implications that it has, but let's be clear, this is a civil rights issue. And I understand that the Emancipation Proclamation did not cure cruelty, the 13th Amendment did not end racism, the 19th Amendment did not bring about total equality for all. The End of segregation did not end the need for civil rights activism, but they were all steps in the right direction. 300 is a step in the right direction. It doesn't claim to cure homelessness. It's not a solution, but it does free up government funding to work on solving this crisis. So I am no on 300. And Lynn, we don't have matter, time for I you to jump in, Los in Angeles. like it that. It does not work. I'm sorry. You sure? Yeah, I'm sorry. You cannot. I, it's not really fair not to let me speak. Um, I'm a definite no on 300 and that's because I've actually lived in Los Angeles and I've seen this firsthand and it doesn't work and the city officials in Los Angeles have admitted that it doesn't work. Um, it spreads uh, crime and illnesses amongst the people. Um, they're spread in tents on the uh, sidewalks in front of businesses. So I am actually working with the Dream Center and Step Denver, meeting with them this week. And I would like to see us implement uh, things that Utah has tried, where everything's under one roof. And we bring people and our resources, the homeless, 
and anybody that is homeless actually, those that get uh, are released from jail often, 60% of them in two weeks are homeless. So bring them under um, one roof where they find counseling, food, job placement, shelter, and it works. Thank you very Speaking much. to Los Angeles, uh, I'm from LA originally. I used to work with the Fred Jordan Mission with the homeless there. The problem of Los Angeles is more advanced than the problem of Denver, but it's the same one, which is uh, racial and wealth inequality. The idea that we can solve it by fear mongering about disease when disease happens in every community is, for lack of a better term, unnecessary. It's not fear mongering, it's just fact. We're going to move on to the next question. Racial equality and equity remain a nationwide concern. Colorado had the most extensive KKK networks west of the Mississippi through the 1930s. The grandson of one ran for governor this past year. A neighborhood and airport are named after him. Educational equity has failed children of color based on zip code. Gentrification continues unabated according to the 2016 Denver Gentrification Study. Gentrification is premised on a view of space as profit margin, not community. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation to modern gentrification. Addressing the racial wealth gap in Colorado, they said the latest view of racial and income inequality in the U.S. shows deep and entrenched disparities along racial lines. How does it play out in Colorado? Not well. Across a range of measures, Colorado was failing to provide equitable opportunities across racial lines. Colorado is third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda. White terror and right-wing violence are the biggest threat to Americans yet people of color suffer, suffer the brunt of policing. Uh, moving on to the next candidate, uh, Councilwoman Ortega, what are your thoughts on racial equality and equity and how will you work to move Denver uh, and by extension Colorado towards a more equal and equitable future? No doubt that it exists, it's well in life. It's in our business environment, it's in our schools. And um, so a couple of things that I have worked on to address this, and I'm sorry, I have a cold so if I'm not able to hear very well. Um, basically, you know, with, with our schools, I've worked within our schools and trying to make sure that we have the right representation. I get very involved in our school board races. In addition to that, you know, with our businesses, I have served as a, a co-chair of task forces working for our disparity study initiative that we have that ensures that our small and minority businesses get to participate in this process. But it starts in our schools because we know there is a school to prison pipeline. And if we're not educating our kids, and that's where it begins, that's where the inequality starts. And it's important that we have money going into pre-K because if kids start school without any kind of preschool, they're starting at a 15,000 word deficit. And so we have to make sure that beginning at their first entry to our education system that we have all the right tools in place that give them the rights to be successful. If they're successful with their education, then they can go on and be and do whatever they wanna be. The last piece I wanna add is in our shelter system, having the social enterprises connected is a critical part of people being able to be successful. Excellent. Replies. I appreciate the lead into the question because I think that the first thing that has to happen is we have to be honest and we have to tell the truth. Um, and until we can all agree upon how we got here um, with um, racism and institutional um, systems that have created this wealth cap that's firmly drawn along the racial lines, we're not gonna have any success solving the problem. You mentioned the Colorado Trust. They also did a report about upward mobility in children and Denver County being the worst county in the state as far as upward mobility for children. That means if you're born into poverty as a child, you're gonna stay uh, in poverty, which is um, not at all acceptable. Uh, we have to right the wrongs of our past after we land on the truth. And in order to do that, we need to invest into, into communities of color. Um, it doesn't need to be a prescription model where we're coming into communities with some idea of what their future looks like. Um, we've got to be sure to meet people where they are, um, look at those communities of color as assets and get um, small businesses started, uh, help with education, health care, and all of that. But we need to be intentional about where we um, put our dollars and our time into communities of color. So is this just open for anybody yes. to reply? Is that work? Okay, so we're not necessarily no. going It doesn't around. have to go in a row. Yeah. It can, it's very orderly if you go in a row. Yeah. Okay, well, I you're more than welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody gets a one-minute response, yeah. but feel okay. free to jump in. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so yeah, we need to start being honest about this. This city alone was segregated 
The city was founded by KKK members. The state was founded by KKK members. This whole, the history of the city and the state is rooted in racism, white supremacy, just like this whole country. So if we really want to level the playing field, we need to increase the amount of contracts that are given to black, owned, black and minority and women-owned businesses. Right now, it's really hard to get through, to get a legitimate business started. We need to increase the, f the funding towards that. And then, as far as our education, I've already, I'm already doing this stuff. I've already met people where they're at. I started an organization called Sankofa Denver. We were educating our black and brown youth about their history, where they come from, because we're about empowerment. We need to empower our youth. We need to stop forcing them into uh, debt by going to these schools. We need to increase the trade apprenticeship programs in the city. Now everybody's cut out for college. We need to have space for those that can utilize the trades. Thank you. I think the inequity in our school is one of the biggest things that's going on. One thing is getting rid of the um, property-based uh, tax funding for, for school districts. Um, uh, if you have higher property tax, the school gets more funding and it just creates inequity. Because um, we need to make sure that our children are educated from day one, as it was mentioned before. But um, a lot of that has to do with the, with the child not receiving the proper education, and then, but continuing on into further grades, not being able to ask for that help later on in life. Not being able to say to someone, I don't know how to read this. I don't understand this problem here. So um, that's, um, we, we need to make sure that our zip codes aren't telling us what schools are funded properly. Um, this also, one of the plans that I want to implement is eventually, this is a long-term goal, but I want um, so American uh, Sign Language to be part of the normal curriculum in schools so that everyone that has the ability to know sign will have that ability to know it when they've graduated. And I want to say really quickly about just the history that we were talking about being an historian. Things I'd like to see um, is people like John Shivington having a lot less um, uh, glorification and people like Black Kettle. Um, who should, who are heroes, be taught about more in our schools and through our public historic sites. Mr. Hayes, we have to stay at a time because we're okay. already going to be overtime, okay. given the amount of candidates. Ms. Langdon, I apologize for earlier uh, coming to my attention that there was a minute for each, each response. I thought it was five minutes open debate. Okay. So you were yes, correct about that. that's what I understood as well. Please so continue. thank you. That's right. Um, like everyone, I'm, always, I'm very concerned about our youth and that everyone has equal access to resources and good teachers and that the teachers are actually paid well enough and that have enough resources to provide to those children. So that's one of uh, my key passions. I obviously, you know, like many of us feel our teachers are underpaid and that needs to be over, we need to recognize that problem and address it. Um, I'm all about communication and going out and um, identifying which areas that are in need the most. And being there, um, I want to be accessible and I want people to be able to uh, come to me, but I'm also interested in hearing from um, the source and figuring out who it is and what, what they feel they need and to tell me. Um, I'm all about action and when I know what the problem is, I can solve it. Do you have time to add any more to that question? At the end, let's finish with Councilwoman Kanish. Mm -hmm. One of the things I often think about as an out lesbian is the fact that most of the legislation that was passed for LGBTQ inclusiveness was led by allies who weren't gay. They came before me and they took up the mantle even though they hadn't walked in my shoes. And for me, that's a mantra that I take into this area of deep humility and deep solidarity with communities of color. I appreciate all the comments about education, but we don't have a lot of direct control over education, but I have a lot of influence over the employment for their parents and the housing practices. And so for me, wage justice is racial justice. First, transforming the wages where people of color are. In our economy, that is a lot of service jobs, and we just gave 8,000 workers a raise, and they will get a raise every single year. In 2021, it'll hit $15, but it'll keep growing. Debbie and I work together, sorry, Councilwoman Ortega and I work together on a policy to get access for communities that are disadvantaged and underrepresented in construction, opportunities for construction careers. You might get a service job to this wage, but you can get a construction career up here. And so ways to transform people's pathway, raise the wages of service jobs and then pathways out of those jobs, that's the answer for wage justice and racial justice. I also so wanna applaud you speaking on diverse issues of uh, race because I think we have focused a lot on education which is only one of the questions that was uh, part of it. Mr. Pickford I believe you had a response. 
Yeah, I think when I talk about more proactive, bold leadership, $15 by 2021 is woefully inadequate. Uh, we need about $28 now uh, to be able to live, into Denver, uh, live in Denver. Um, and so we, we need more resources there. And City Council doesn't have direct legislative purview over DPS, but they do have tremendous influence. Uh, the incumbents will confirm that um, City Council hasn't met with Denver Public School Board in quite some time. Uh, those need to be regular meetings. We need to work with the city to get more teachers of color in our schools so our students have teachers that look like them. And we can't punt things that aren't necessarily in our legislative purview. Um, we've got to push the needle and use the platform and the megaphone that we have as at-large city council people to really work on equity in all sectors, not just education. Not to cut you off, um, and not to cut you off, but just for time, we have to move on to the next question. It, it looked like I you were agree, about to agree. I agree with a lot of agree. things Tony said, and I really feel that we need to be thinking outside of our jobs and outside of sitting behind our desk. And even though we don't have direct influence, we, I mean, we need to go out and be meeting with these people and reaching outside of our jobs. Thank you, Ms. Lang. Thank you. So our next question, April, it, starting with some information here, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, a few facts, if you would. One in five women and one in 71 men in the United States have been raped at some time in their lives. 42% of victims experienced their first completed rape before the age of 18. A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads had been sexually assaulted. CU is in the news currently for a recent rape. Denver's DA, Beth McCann, was found in 2018 to have prosecuted 33% of rape cases, only a small improvement over her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post rape tracker shows that Denver has had 185 sexual assaults reported so far this year, which is up from 122 when we began this debate series and an average of 54.1 per month. The average number of rapes per neighborhood this year is 2.37. These numbers are very staggering. How will you use your seat on the council to address these issues and make Colorado a safer place for women and female identified bodies? We're looking for specifics here. Um, and, and as a reminder, when we're going on to doing our answers, uh, please stick to the time and try not to speak out if you haven't been called upon. We have a limited amount of time to get through this for all of us to speak. Yes. Mr. Pickford. Thank you. I'm a root cause type of thinker and I think that the, the root cause is how we socialize our boys. Uh, that's why I took on the opportunity to open the boys' school. How we socialize our boys is arguably one of the most important things we can do as a nation. When we socialize them a particular way, we see how that manifests, and they become the sexual assault perpetrators, the mass shooters, etc. And so we have to look very deeply at how our school systems, how our culture, how our parents, and how our communities socialize our boys. That's a starting place. And then we need accountability in city government. We saw it with Mayor Hancock's sexual harassment that city council I was honestly a little bit embarrassed because city council wouldn't call it what it was. It was sexual um, harassment 101. And so we need leaders that will call things exactly what they are. And some things have improved about accountability in city government, but I still think that there is a level of fear for our uh, women workers in our city government. Um, and we need to elect leaders that will be sure that there is a real accountability so that these statistics are a thing of the past. Thank you. Mr. Paris. Uh, we can start by uh, repealing the urban camper ban. A lot of our unhoused neighbors have been victims of rape due to having to be moved around um, from their encampments, their communities where they had a sense of community and had to go into dark areas, areas where they were not um, protected and were victimized as a result. Um, it starts with this culture. We have to deal, we have to come to grips with the culture of America. This country was founded off of rape and slavery. So we have to come to grips with that. Then we need to educate our youth to know that this is not acceptable behavior. Our current commander in chief is exactly what we don't want to be. So I agree with Tony. We need to start by educating our youth, especially our boys, let them know this is not acceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, we need more accountability at the um, city leadership. What Mayor Hancock did is not acceptable. And we need people on council that will call that out. <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Hayes. So thank you. Um, to be uh, specific about um, the answers, I would say, first of all, transparency needs to take place within our institutions. Um, 
So uh, what City Council do that is, is try to implement uh, certain laws or programs that, that make that happen. Um, I agree that it's um, a cultural thing that needs to be uh, addressed and, and, and changed and, and people need to be taught um, ab about this and, and uh, just the, the causes, effects, the culture and just, just be educated so that we can have our youth develop into good citizens. And um, finally, it's, 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 for me, most of the problems I believe facing the city council can be solved through a different type of organization. So putting some sort of committee together that specifically addresses this, that specifically addresses individual needs and the accountability for something like the district attorney, um, for government accountability. If uh, they pick and choose which cases they want to prosecute based on what they think they can win. Uh, that's sort of how uh, uh, the, the attorney works. So just holding them accountable so that anybody that needs to be prosecuted will be prosecuted. Thank you. Um, this um, link. So I grew up in the 80s and the whole culture was so different and most women I know have at some point been assaulted sexually in some way, shape or form. Um, it's happened to me several times in different ways and um, not rape but um, sexual assault and uh, you know I got to be honest I, I didn't want to talk about it you just don't I mean I think we've heard that over and over again from several people um, not up here I'm sorry in today's society about you know it's not something you want to be open about and you actually brush it off and you try to make excuses for the person or what happened and you know you want to go on with your day so I would like to sit, maybe see uh, more centers open where uh, first of all more dialogue and more communication where people uh, and women, young women, uh, realize that no, that's not okay, and you can um, be vocal about that, and actually open centers where maybe they can go and uh, share their experiences and um, talk about what's happened to them and if they need to report it. Thank you. Thank Councilwoman Kamish. Thank you. In addition to the personal experiences with this issue, I began my career working with women who were victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. And one of the facts about this situation is that it's not as strangers many times. It's loved ones, it's partners, it's spouses. And so the two need to be addressed together because one might be a rape that ends, the other might be a danger that continues. And so you need different interventions. Um, first, I begin by believing. And second, I begin by being an advocate. So one of the things we had in the past was a backlog of rape kits. And through the advocacy of the state legislature and the city council to fund that backlog, we were able to process more of those rape kits. Secondly, I had the unfortunate experience of serving on a jury. It is very difficult, particularly where there's an acquaintance involved. Um, the jury I sat on was hung because they were unwilling to believe that this man did this to someone he loved or had been in a relationship with. Um, I want to talk about the idea of resources. So I have stepped out of my role in the city council policy. I believe in first making an impact with my official role, but advocating for sexuality education throughout DPS with the superintendent. Councilwoman, we're about 10 seconds over your time. I apologize. Yep. Oh, I missed the hand. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I served as the board president of a Latina safe house during the same time that our city worked to open up the Rosandum Center. And this is where all of our domestic violence organizations were brought together in one physical location. Um, and one of the things people don't realize is if you're an undocumented woman who has been assaulted, either by a family member or by a stranger, they're afraid to call the police. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we have resources available for them. The average person has access to other resources that are available. The Rosandum Center is that very place for our Denver community. But for our undocumented immigrant women, not just in the Hispanic community, but you know, in other cultures, it is critically important that we have safe places for them to go as well. And um, we're, we're doing that with some of the organizations and our churches that exist in our city. There was an interesting point that Mr. Hayes made that uh, Beth McCann or DAs will pick and choose which cases to prosecute. Um, I think it's more complicated than that. I mean, they do pick and choose, but not all prosecutions <coughs> are viable. And it's about the police from the evidentiary moment with the sane nurse mm -hmm. in the hospital from the beginning examination all the way through chain of custody to the courtroom. 
if we're only getting to 33% of prosecutions, uh, where is the breakdown and how as a city council person can we fix it? I think we have time for maybe one or two replies to that question. Well, we don't directly get to oversee the district attorney who's independently elected, right. but I would be curious to see more data on what the victim wishes are. It's really critical to always ask a victim what their desires are, and I know that they have a very strong victim advocacy program, so I'd want to know where those victims were in those decision-making processes. Um, and I, I think that that is, um, the council doesn't get to supervise, hire, fire the district attorney, but where there is identified need for resources, that's an issue. And then how do we do the education of the jury pool to make sure that mm -hmm. jurors are more apt to believe women? I do agree totally with Tony Pigford on this. I'm a mom of a son and it's about talking to him and then it's about all of us talking to people who sit on juries and are skeptical of believing women. That's where prosecutors need a better jury pool, honestly. But also, like you said, it's um, um, the delay in the reporting and the communication from the actual victim, oftentimes then the evidence is gone. So probably encouraging a, an immediate uh, response from the victim and a reporting, and then but the evidence might be there can where I they just can add One of the biggest um, resource issues that is needed, especially when, uh, if it's a, a family, you know, the, the mom needs to get away from the perpetrator, it's access to housing. And that's the biggest gap that we have. We do have some shelters in our city that will we'll take folks in these situations, but they're very short term. So having housing for these situations is vitally critical. Yeah, that's actually very true. There's I appreciate your thoughts. We're gonna have to move on to the next question. Okay. You guys are doing, you're all doing terrific. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Thank you. Uh, question four is on community wellness. According to denverpublichealth.org, city council district report for Denver overall, Denver's overall life expectancy is 78.6 years, and that varies across district. Uh, there, these stark differences remind us that place matters. There's different places inside the city uh, that seem to matter more. 17% of young adults aged uh, 18 to 24 uh, use tobacco. 16% of Denver public school children, 2 to 17, are obese. And 13% of adults uh, in Denver have been diagnosed with depression, a common issue uh, across all of Denver. It averages about 1 in 10 people. Denver.gov states that the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. Healthy communities are composed of our physical environment, healthy opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, healthy food systems, and safe environments. Increased access to these items allow individuals of a healthy community to thrive. Uh, do you believe Denver is serving its community equitably in these areas? And if not, what will you do to address these disparities? I believe we're starting with Mr. Paris. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. No, I don't think Denver is serving um, its community adequately with these issues. Um, this has become the mile high income city. You have to have mile high income to live here. There's people working two, three, four jobs just to make ends meet in this town. That causes a lot of stress. That could lead to a lot of depression. Um, and the way we treat our on-house neighbors is just unacceptable. Like that needs to stop. And the reason, part of the reason why I ran for office is because I was tired of the treatment that our own house neighbors were receiving. But not only that, I'm tired of the treatment that um, black and brown communities are receiving. We are being thrown to the wolves, if you will. And it's just not acceptable. So as your next city council at large, I would make sure that there was more resources put into these communities, especially these communities where um, the, a lot of the residents and community members feel like they have been forgotten. They have been neglected and not listened to at all. My thing is about community involvement. I want the community involved in everything that we do. And I am that guide or council person that's willing enough to reach out a hand and go above and beyond my job title. Okay, um, so I think there's three elements to a healthy human being and that's a health, healthy physical to be healthy physically, be healthy mentally, and to be healthy, what I would call like spirit or, or attitude. Um, I, I do, I wanna start with the mental health aspect because I do have a, a history and, and study psychology at my university. And um, you, you mentioned depression. I mean, one of the things that I want the average person to know, I, I would love it if mental health was not a dirty word. Um, every mental health disorder or illness is an extension of normal behavior. 
Um, depression, for instance, is an extension of, of feeling sad, which is normal. Um, so going on to the solutions for that, I believe that there's more need for more mental health treatment, more mental health care on varying degrees of varying different levels, because not everyone needs the same thing. Not everyone needs a chemical treatment along with uh, specific therapy. Um, but to answer your question about the uh, equitability in, in certain neighborhoods like Swanton Global, when we see development happens there, we see the physical health go down too. So that needs to be addressed, certainly. Thank you. So adding to, on to what Johnny was saying, um, I agree thoroughly. We need to have more open dialogue and more awareness around uh, mental illness. And um, you know, if Oprah and Prince Harry are working on a series about mental mental illness, I mean, it tells you something. But um, you know, thankfully, our society is moving in the direction where it's not such a stigma, and people who have depression or they're feeling, um, so, you know, going in and out of uh, depression or bouts of anxiety um, are getting to the point where it's not shame they're not feeling shameful about it and being able to reach out but you know um public campaigns are actually really a valid way to make it a normal thing and in hong kong they used to actually have commercials that would say be kind to the mentally ill now obviously that's a little bit silly but you know i mean it just goes to show you these were commercials in public that you know we're talking about it and i just i would like to see more open dialogue around it so people don't feel stigmatized thank you as long as there's a disparity the work is not done and so and i think we have to broaden our sense of public health so it's not healthy for youth that are growing up in neighborhoods where there's violence that is a risk to their health physically as well as motion, mentally and emotionally and so violence prevention right which is all the adult support systems and interventions um, we have more suicides than we do homicides and we have more traffic deaths than we do suicides. So safe intersections will help extend people's lives in neighborhoods where they're getting hit by cars. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about substance abuse, we need to increase access and speed with which people get medical replacement. So if you have an opioid addiction, quitting can actually kill you, but going on a medical replacement can be a way for you to medically wean off the illegal drug and be able to have a healthy life. We're experimenting with some immediate access through a mobile center. We need to do more of that. And then access to healthy food. We can't buy grocery stores to make them come into neighborhoods, but we have to keep working on food access to fight obesity. Thank you, Councilman Kamish. I want to talk Karen. about a couple of things that I have done around this issue. Um, I encouraged our mayor to look at Seattle's program on, on race and equity, and they have trained well over 100 people in that same model. And it's important that we not just train people, but that it gets applied in our neighborhoods where we're dealing with various issues around um, air quality, around school um, disparities in terms of the, the quality of education that's offered, um, issues around access to medical, around access to healthy food. Mm -hmm. And um, those are some things that I've done. One of the things that I'm working on right now is the fact that National Western is planning to have a public, public market in a very neighborhood that is a food desert that would create not only an opportunity to bring some healthy food, but to create an opportunity where the SNAP benefit would, would be allowed where people could go purchase food at that location as well. Thank you. Mr. Pickford. I think we've got mass inequity across our city. Um, that's where I would start is that things aren't equitable. And, and part of the reason that I chose the at-large position um, to run for versus a district position is because I think that it's perfectly primed to be sure that we're putting the most marginalized community at the center of all policy making um, and be sure that the most vulnerable communities are, are put first. The true health of any city or community is, is the plight of its most vulnerable. Uh, I would argue that we're not doing a very good job in the at-large city council representatives and there's two uh, should be the ones holding that holding that value that we be sure that the most marginalized are put the center put at the center of every uh, policy making decision mm -hmm. uh, with the city budget and the bonds we've passed we're going to spend over 11 billion dollars without cost overruns uh, we need to start rethinking about uh, where we're spending our resources and put our most marginalized community our most marginalized communities excuse me at the center of everything that we do can I just add to this really quickly to say that in this bond project, 
a lot of that money is going to be going into neighborhoods where they have not had curb gutter sidewalks and we're taking care of some of those very Parks things and that are needed centers. and bringing every neighborhood to a basic standard of living the, the issue that i have with that is they're going to be basically sheltered inside their homes for 10 years as the i-70 expansion construction starts and these are communities that have been historically just uh, brutal cycles of environmental it's, racism. It's not just benefiting those neighborhoods as well. It's neighborhoods across the city Westwood's where we have time. these disparities. I, but you brought up, Ms. Uh, Councilwoman Ortega, you brought up uh, air quality. Uh, and Johnny, you were the first one, Mr. Hayes, I apologize, who brought up Swansea. Yeah. Uh, Swansea, Globeville, Illyria, Illyria right. are a mess. And we have sure. uh, what Mr. Mendez called curve. transboundary uh, pollution, right? Yeah. We have an issue. Uh, even if you're outside, even if we have safer intersections, even if we have more crosswalks, walking around outside in Colorado is bad for your health. One thing what do I, we do? I want to draw attention to is the Suncor oil refinery is in Commerce City. It's not in the city and county of Denver. True. But Suncor was able to expand production. Um, the at-large position should be a position where we're building relationships with surrounding municipalities so that we can address some of the largest corporate polluters like Suncor. Uh, you can see that they spew millions of cyanide gas over near North Denver. And so we need at-large council people who will address these issues regionally so that we're not experiencing anymore what you just described. We have to move on to the last question. I apologize. So a topic that's very near to our hearts. Uh, media is in crisis here in Colorado. Denver Open Media, our host, uh, has been defunded. The Denver Post and Daily Camera, our region's only two major print newspapers, are owned by hedge funds uh, who are busy extracting capital and laying off staff. Fake news is the slur of the day, thanks to our current president. How do we support our local newspapers, community journalism, and organizations like Denver Open Media that will work to be a pillar of community information and provide equal access, educational programs, and media training to everyone? We'll start with you, Mr. Hayes. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, one thing that I think uh, is important for um, for open journalism, uh, for, for public uh, uh, um, services in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that topic is for public funding for things that need, uh, like uh, our public broadcasting for ex is an example of, of one of those things. But uh, we may need to go beyond that for things that play an important part of our community, that play an important role, and decide how do things that need to be funded get funded. I mean, it, it comes through many ways. It comes, it's not all just government spending. It comes through private donations and, and, um, and uh, uh, nonprofit um, sector as well. Um, but it, it, and it, it goes into the, um, to the ethical development that, development that we need to turn to. That doesn't just mean the development of our structures and our, 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 our buildings, uh, but it also means to our community, to our infrastructures, to our, um, the things that affect us. Uh, and media, and the First Amendment is one of those things. Anything that represents that First Amendment uh, it falls in line with that. Um, so uh, we, we support it in, in those, um, um, in, by funding it, and um, by uh, just making sure that, um, that, that there's ethical treatment of different outreaches. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Ms. Langdon. So I don't have a direct, concise answer to that question. I do know that obviously uh, everything with media is changing. Our newspapers, uh, there's very few people that actually get the newspaper anymore and read a uh, hard copy newspaper. They're actually just going online. So everything with, that, with media is changing. Um, and therefore, I think we obviously need to just start thinking outside the box and um, private donorship, uh, private and partnerships, uh, alliances, um, you know, if they want to support a radio station and, and journalists with scholarships, things like that. I mean, uh, again, I would have to know what specific problems each person is having and, you know, open a dialogue and try to solve, you know, the issues as best I can. But Thank you. 
Councilman Kniech. Personally, I do subscribe and I donate to the sources that don't do subscriptions. And professionally, I believe that the media is really critical to democracy. As an elected official, it's my obligation to return the calls from reporters. And I've been very open about sharing my work and briefing them when we did the police accountability bill, the housing fund, walking them through how it works. Because and, and then frankly, in my private communications, you know, calling out Alden Media in terms of their uh, calling on them to sell the post, um, on the monthly or the, the annual uh, Media Matters campaign, acknowledging the value that the media plays to our democracy and being a voice that says this matters. We don't always agree, but it matters. And then ultimately, I think it is about helping to have our community understand the value, right? In the past, newspapers did endorsements in council races. Looks like they may not do that this year. Helping them understand how all of the types of work you're doing to get the word out about this campaign. And so I think just to continue to talk to folks about that value. Can't be the only subscriber. Thank you. Councilman Ortega. So I go back to when um, this cable franchise was created under Mile High um, and Denver Open Media is a beneficiary as was many of our community-based uh, programs that provided both training. I was one of the original people that got to be trained on how to work a camera and you know put a small production together and having that opportunity especially for our kids and I know this program has done a phenomenal job making sure that our youth are being trained to be some of our, our future uh, reporters, uh, whether you know it's print or television or whatever, but um, having these kinds of programs publicly funded is vitally important, and that's part of what the cable franchise money is used for. And um, I have gone to bat for Denver Open Media in ensuring that this program continues to exist, very much as I have supported the Denver Right and uh, the independent newspaper, online newspapers. Thank you. Mr. Pickering. I'm pretty excited and optimistic about what I describe as a social revolution that's happening and it's much needed. And there's two ingredients to that social revolution that are integral, art and honest media and journalism. Um, and so we need at-large city council folks, and there's been some great answers here, who understand the importance of media and art in moving forward um, as a city um, and as a region and as a country. And so I think that we need to coalesce on council, ideally at least nine city council members, because when they cut the funding for this wonderful organization, that's a city budget decision. And the only way to push back against the mayor's budget is to have uh, nine or so city council members um, aligned. And so I think that we've got to have um, more city council people aligned that will fight for shifting some resources. Um, and again, I'll state we're spending over $11 billion on various projects and things. We sure as heck can find a way um, to fund organizations like this. We have one more response from Mr. Paris and then a rebuttal from Councilwoman Kanish. Okay, um, I grew up on media. so. KDKO, Dr. Daddy O was one of my favorite radio broadcasts I listened to growing up. And it's a shame to see that we don't have more outlets like that. We currently have uh, Brother Jeff's live show um, in the black community. And that's just very unfortunate because the media is the way that we communicate the information what the government is doing to the masses of the people. If the masses of people are in the dark, then you can just pass stuff like the urban camping ban and other legislation that people don't have a clue about. Um, you can pass all these developments, all this stuff. I'm glad that Denver 8 is um, allowing for that transparency so the people at home can see what council is doing. But I agree with Tony, we need a consolidation of uh, at least nine council members to put this funding back so you guys can still be in operation. Okay. Thank you, sir. Councilwoman. Yeah, and I agree with Tony about the need for a majority, but unfortunately the council doesn't get to vote on the who. The budget mm -hmm. does not have the names of who gets what's line item, and council only votes on contracts of more than 500,000, of which this was not one. So there was no council power to stop this particular decision. I too was in dozens of meetings advocating. I think we got a little extra time at one point. We got a little equipment. We still have some battles to fight, I learned today. 
But what I will say that Tony is right about is one thing we need to do is create a better structure where we can have that power. So I'm committed to leading a structural uh, creation of, of a, some kind of cooperative advisory body where we do have a seat in the decision making again. That was something council had in the past, so we should have the authority to put it back. But it was dismantled before my time on council, and so I, you know, it's not something you might have been able to know, but we don't get to vote on decisions under 500K, and the budget has no contractor names in it, just Thank functions. you, Councilwoman. I think so. we have one last reply before we move on to the lightning round. Yeah, just to expand on what Ms. Kanish was saying, I, I would like to see that happen with City Council, where going into the future, whoever is elected, that we, there's more opportunity for City Council to be involved in some of these decisions that were left out of. So that would be an exciting thing to maybe move the bar and change. Awesome. That. Thank you. We've made it through the major body. Good work. Good job. Thank you for your answers. Yes. I feel like I personally <laughs> learned a lot. <laughs> the lightning round is uh, quick and easy. It's very fast. Oh, I'm taking my mic off. Don't take, your mic, don't take your mic off just yet. Uh, accepting and understanding that these are complex issues and that we can definitely debate the nuance of each topic. What we're asking for is a general yes or a general no. Yeah. We'll fire, we'll fire it down and then we'll fire up. Does that sound? <laughs> Sound good. All right. So Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to super, supersede RTD in the city. Are you for or against, Councilwoman? That's not what it does. It's incorrect. I agree with that statement. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede RTD in the city. Are you for compliment. or against? Denver is un unveiling its own transportation system it just reorganizes the city departments that's all it does it does not take over any transit functions it's not at all. it's not but taking over transit functions our city will be a separate one yeah. no it, it it has no money for new transit it it, it doesn't i'm sorry you're, it's just not accurate the we, department is simply a reorganization of the existing functions there is no new funding for transit as part of the organization oh, we're working on a funding source right now if and when that funding source is identified, then it would be figuring out whether and how we buy out service from RTD, supplement it, but that is about well, three years Well, then we'll have to double check on this. Every other incumbent that we've talked to has been on board I'm with it or against it. So um, we'll move on to the second one instead. I'm friends with Doug Tisdale, who's not, on the board of directors of RTD. Second but, one, Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner, yes or no? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again? Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner, yes or no? Oh, I, I'm for it. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Denver is voting on decriminalizing mushrooms, the psilocybin initiative. Legalize mushrooms, yes or no? Councilman. No. No. Yes. 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 No. State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves what works best to support lower income renters. If the ban removal passes, would you support rent control in Denver? Yes or no? No, I'm not Yes. Bad. Hell yes. Yes. Yes, we've done that in Denver. Yes. Do you support deferred action for childhood arrivals DACA? Yes or no? Yes. 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 No. Yes. Yes. The Olympics Initiative, prohibiting the use of public monies, resources, or fiscal guarantees in connection with any future Olympic Games without the city first obtaining voter approval, for or against? I, I'm for voter approval. For. Yes. For. Yes. 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 Ban fracking in Colorado, yes or no? Constitutionally prohibited. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, <coughs> yes. I fought that in Stapleton. Yes. 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 Uh, April 10th was Equal Pay Day. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Act was recently heard in committee. Do you support a law to ensure equal pay, yes or no? Yes. 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 Democracy for the People Act banned corporations and other entities from donating di directly to candidates, lower contribution limits, and create matching funds, officially bringing campaign finance reform to Denver. Did you support? Two E, yes or no? Yes. Yes. It's one of the five original people to get it started. Yes. 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 And finally, ending with some important geopolitical intrigue. Uh, who's going to win the Game of Thrones? <laughs> I sadly don't know. Sorry. You have no idea? <coughs> I'm taking. I'm, we have I'm a pool. 
I'm going to lose a lot of votes here. I'm that person who's never seen it. Oh. I, don't, I can't afford cable. <laughs> the dragons? Dragons will win. Santa. Sansa, that's it. First answer. First Sansa answer. Yeah, I haven't heard that. Probably be John. You think John? Uh, the guys Do we have to start win. calling him Aegon now? Do win. we have to call him Aegon now? That's the question. Um, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, thank you for participating. At this point, thank we're going to do. Thank you. One minute. One minute. <laughs> Closing statements. Closing statements. <laughs> the whisper was weird. I didn't know what was going on. Like, um, we began earlier with Councilwoman <laughs> Kanish, so we will start here uh, with Ms. Langdon. Hi, so uh, my name is Lynn Langdon. I am looking forward to working hard for you and passionately for Denver in the future. I'd like to bring more dialogue and inclusivity to decisions around development because that's the biggest complaint I've heard from um, all the citizens that I've been talking to directly, that they feel that they've been left out of the process of the growth of Denver, and um, I look to change that. Thank you so much. My name is Lynn Langdon. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Johnny Hayes. I do want to address a couple things that were mentioned here. Um, one of uh, my platforms is to go um, from profit-based development to ethical development. Things like valuing and engineering. Um, that'd be an example. That'd be like on, uh, off-site manufacturing, um, which cuts down on the time of development uh, and might deal with some of these uh, pollution problems that we're having within places like Swansea and Globeville. Um, I understand the like. Uh, just to address another thing that was brought up, the because um, uh, government accountability is something that I. Uh, wish to accomplish as a city council member. I understand that we don't have direct um, control over something like the district attorney or uh, what happens sometimes in the school system, but we do have the power of investigation over government employees and along with government agencies. Um, so these are important things to me um, when they've been mishandled. Uh, the other things that I do uh, to remind you is I promote, I'm a promoter of the arts. I want to bring those jobs to Denver, uh, the film community that wants to be here in Denver, um, of the deaf community, and um, of every uh, person, every single person deserves their civil rights and those to be protected. So please vote Johnny Hayes, May 7th. Just Sean Parrish, Justice for the Poor, People Over Profit. I'm not running for you, I'm running with you. We have had eight years of the same old same status quo. And if you're tired of being maligned, neglected, this place, gentrified out of your communities, not able to age in place if you're a senior, and not being able to afford to live in the mile high income city. I ask for your vote in May. We can do better than this, and we need new proactive and bold leadership on city council, not just for our large, but the other districts as well. So I'm Jesse LaShawn Paris. My slogan is justice for the poor, people over profit. I'm the only candidate up here that's currently poor at or below the poverty line, and I can relate to those that are suffering the most in this town. So I ask for your vote on May 7th. Thank you. My name is Tony Pigford. This has been a pleasure. Thank you again for hosting us, and thanks to uh, you all for your service uh, in Denver and all, all the candidates. Um, I come from a long line of educators, entrepreneurs, and social justice champions. I'm running out of having a, a deep moral <coughs> conviction, not out of any personal ambition. Uh, the proactive leadership that I spoke about, I've got some experience in that. I was one of the five people to get campaign finance reform uh, brought to Denver in 2E. It passed with 72% of the vote. I started working on that over two and a half years ago. I wasn't thinking about running. I knew we needed change. I also was one of the people that helped start the Let Denver Vote uh, ballot initiative, which was brought up earlier around the Olympics. And so those are two examples. Uh, where those are two citizen-led initiatives that are really going to change um, what Denver uh, will look like. Um, we're at an inflection point. I hope that the turnout is high. Uh, we're at a critical point. It's arguably the most important election in recent Denver history. We have the chance to make Denver the most vibrant, equitable, and sustainable city. I hope to earn your vote, and I hope to be one of your next city council at large representatives. My name is Tony Pigford. Thank you. I'm Debbie Ortega, and if you haven't already sent your ballot in, I ask for your vote. I've dedicated my entire adult life to serving the public. Um, I have fought for making sure that we have a city that is, that is fair and equitable to all of our communities. Um, I have fought to ensure that we uh, protect the public trust, because I think that is very important in 
all the work that we do and that we continue to be a transparent uh, city in, in all the decision-making processes that we have. I've done that, I will continue to do that, and I ask for your support. Thank you to our moderators and for the studio and open media. Tonight I've shared some of the accomplishments that I've had and I've shared the partnerships with the community that made each of them possible. I'm running to build on those to help to impact thousands more lives with the next generation of policy advancements. Climate, we have to implement that plan to get to 2030. There are more renters protections, hopefully that the legislature will give us permission to do. Participatory budgeting, to bring people into direct control over a portion of our budget so they can make neighborhood decisions about infrastructure at that level. And then buses. We talked a little bit about what that department isn't doing quite yet, but I'm committed to finding sustainable funding for transportation because buses were, are where the civil rights of our people began in many ways in this country. And being able to get to jobs, to education, quickly, efficiently, and affordably is key. So those are things I look forward to working on if I have the honor of receiving a third term. I wanna thank the community for the partnerships I've had and ask for one of your two votes. I'm Robin Kanish. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin Kanish, Debbie Ortega, Tony Pickford, Jesse LaShawn Paris, uh, Johnny Hayes, and Lynn Langdon. Thank you so much for being here and, and joining us tonight, sharing your stance on uh, some of Colorado's most pressing issues. Uh, we wish you all the best during your race. Um, and let's, let's go May 7th. Um, also to our audience, thank you so much for taking time out um, and joining us in becoming informed citizens as you head to the polls. Remember that the change that you seek in your community really starts with you. It begins with your voice, your vote, and it matters. Um, again, we'd like to thank Denver Open Media and the Open Media Foundation, as well as Civic Matters for hosting tonight's event. Again, I'm Sarah Alley. And I'm De La Vaca. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.